Okay, how you doing, everybody? And welcome to episode number 112 of the John Riley Project. That's a lot, That actually. is a lot, actually. When I heard over 100, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you stick with it. and uh, 112. And so today is Sunday, uh, February 16th, right? Mm-hmm. Casual day. Casual day. Okay. <laughs> and my guest today, uh, none other than Miss Gabby Dow. Hello. Hello. You're an entrepreneur, business owner, a private public technology consultant. You're a community activist. Rancho Bernardo resident, long mm-hmm. time here in the community, and a, a mother. A, a mom, most importantly. Yeah. And, <laughs> and a and, wife. And a wife. And I mean, you've been here, <clears throat> excuse me, you've been here before. Your husband has been mm-hmm. here on the podcast. Thank you for coming back again today. We love it. We listen all the time. I go on walks with the dogs, and I'm listening to all the amazing guests you have. And lately, I'm saying out loud, thank you, because some of the things that you're saying uh, are so important just in terms of our values above you know above everything else. Oh, so, thanks. Yeah, thank I, you. I, I appreciate the feedback because sometimes I feel like I'm in the wilderness, you know, no. just sharing my thoughts and opinions. Um, but I appreciate that. Absolutely. Yes. You're shaping uh, you're shaping our community. Trying and to. the future for our kids. It's very important. You know, trying to exert what little influence I can, you mm-hmm. know. But I think having guests like you gives the community a different perspective. We mm-hmm. get to meet some interesting people, learn about topics, because, you know, my knowledge is only this big. But by meeting other people, we, we can just cover a wide range of issues. Exactly. So what's what's on your mind these days? Oh, my gosh. A ton of infrastructure projects. Mm-hmm. So right now, um, yeah, I'm just working on a lot of uh, water, wastewater always. You know, it's one mm-hmm. of the most important things for communities and for the biotechs and the other businesses to thrive. But, mm-hmm. you know, we need clean water. Power way, I think, yeah. knows that <laughs> after yeah. the recent experience. <laughs> That's um, right. But a lot of transportation projects. So some really exciting things happening in San Diego with transportation planning. Um, a lot of just planning for the future. Um, where are our kids going to live? Where are they going to go to school? How are we, go- are we going to meet sustainability and environmental demands? Um, that's just the reality. It doesn't matter what party you're from. It doesn't matter yeah. what your belief system is. Right. If you have a broken sewer pipe or you don't have clean water um, or um, you're realizing you, you know, it takes longer to get from point A to point B or we don't know what we're going to be doing 20 years from now. Um, those are just the core infrastructure community needs. And it seems like um, that's really been a focus. And yeah. then, of course, it's election time. So yeah. it's just a little bit crazy at the local and national level. There's so much going on. And and you're right. I think the, the infrastructure and transportation is huge because we have a housing crisis. Mm-hmm. We're trying to resolve that. You know, there's uh, the county wants to grow and there's measures on the ballot for that. Mm-hmm. But how do you plan it so people aren't stuck in traffic? How do you plan it so homes are built in areas that it's sustainable? Mm -hmm. And then then sustainability, how do you provide energy Mm -hmm. and do it intelligently with thinking towards the future? Mm -hmm. We're just at an incredible time, I think, Yeah, in uh, the San Diego region, Mm -hmm. in California, and um, in in just, you know, a moment in history, I think, across the world. Um, We spent our summer visiting family in Germany and in Norway, Mm -hmm. spent a little bit of time in Copenhagen. And I'm originally from Mexico, and so of course I know all about you know different lifestyle yeah. um, in, in different parts of the world. But it's so interesting just to see what other countries take for granted, and transportation is yeah. part of that. Yeah. In Copenhagen, you know, it, it really was everybody rides their bike everywhere. Right. Um, in Germany, my boys were very upset because their younger cousins can take the train, and they you know go from one train to another to go rowing, uh, you know, in the in the water across town. Mm-hmm. I would not let my kids. I don't think, you know, take the you know trolley and train and buses by themselves and certainly not a 10 year old. You probably maybe would even get arrested if you <laughs> if right. you did that. Yeah. Very different. And uh, my family in Norway uh, just still can't not believe that uh, education is not available to every young person um, in the country. I mean, they're just like, how where are you going to get your engineers and doctors from? Right. If you have a young person who has the ability and wants to work hard, of course, you push them through to do great in high school and then to do great two years or four years or as much college as possible without your future leaders worrying about the cost. That's what society invests in. Mm-hmm. And our my, my Steve's my husband's um, sister who married a German in Hamburg. He's a brain surgeon. And so we're very dialed into healthcare. Um, and he just said, I, I can't imagine discussing cost with my patients. Um, we are there to save their lives, to provide them 
life-saving care. Mm -hmm. And we don't get into insurance discussions. And at one point, they looked at moving back to the United States. She studied at Georgetown and in Chicago. And they did come back for a little while. He worked at the National Institutes of Health. But they said the health insurance and the cost of education, they have four kids, is completely untenable. And this is, you know, she has her PhD and does well as a college professor. And he, of course, is a, you know, a brain Mm -hmm. surgeon. He Mm -hmm. would have to redo his residency all over again, which would be another thing. But they just, it's just like we've, life has changed in the United States. And it is very, very difficult in in all of the wrong ways. Um, And a lot of it does have to do with our young generation. Yeah, there's a lot changing, you know, talking about tuition-free college or canceling student Mm -hmm. debt. And then there's the talk, you know, single-payer health care. What I find fascinating with this is that people generally think that there's really only two options. Mm -hmm. That's what America is doing today and what Scandinavia is doing. Mm -hmm. And which one do you prefer? But I've always contended that what we have now in America is unquestionably is a cluster. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's excessively expensive. Mm -hmm. And you have to address cost at some level because people have to pay for that. But the, the funny thing that I find is that in America... Healthcare and education are highly, highly regulated by the government, and we have really high prices, mm-hmm. which is interesting. Housing is the same way. Um, so I often wonder: Is there a third way? You know, is there a way that we can learn things from Scandinavia, get rid of the inefficiencies and the cronyism and all the nonsense that's in America, mm-hmm. and come up with something that's going to be more efficient, simpler, less expensive without being so coercive? That's the challenge for us. It yeah. really is. We are the innovators. We've led the world in yeah. you know, democracy, civil rights. Um, I think people are finding that we're not quite where we thought we were as a model for the world. Um, But we're all in it together when it comes to anybody could get hit by a car. How do we deal with something (laughs) like that, right? Anybody, everybody gets cancer. I'm a breast cancer survivor myself, stage three. So it was, you know, it was a fight for sure at 35 years old. So very difficult. Um, How do we get better? And how do we make sure that everybody has preventative care? It is so sad to think about people that can't take their child to the doctor, um, you know, so that they can get their flu shot. Right. Or her, and, and now we have all the vaccine, you know, anti-vax yeah. situation. Yeah, uh, It's a lot. It's a lot. But that's our challenge. That's what I think we have to figure out. And, you know, I think the community colleges are now doing free tuition. Yeah. Um, that's that's incredible. And our community college district is just fantastic mm-hmm. here in San Diego. I serve on the uh, on an advisory board for the School of Business and Economics. Oh, right on. Um, yeah. And so, I mean, the things I see, it's like, this is an incredible education, very affordable. So mm-hmm. it doesn't have to be uh, Stanford, right? Um, mm-hmm. you know, and it doesn't have to be, you, we still have private schools. You can go to USC and you can pay for that. Um, I went to UCLA and you can, um, you know, there's a selection process for the school, San Diego State right now is, um, you know, it's also very difficult to get into or yeah. UCSD. Yes. Um, but you're right. It's not, it's not all or nothing, but right now it's nothing for people who just can't pull the money together. It's really sad. And that is really our middle class that gets squeezed. Yeah. It's tough. You know, life is tough, you know, and (laughs) and sometimes the system is set up in a way that trap people in bad spots Mm -hmm. and keeps them kind of contained in a bad situation where there's other people that the system has been rigged for them to their benefit. So it's, it's tricky. Yeah. But let's, Let's break down some of these local issues. You know, we've got these uh, election coming up in a couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. You know, people have already got their ballots. We're in it. Yeah, I have They're my ballot. F- I'm sending it back, I think, today. <laughs> you know, and so I, I got the, uh, over here, the voter guides. Mm-hmm. It was interesting is I got this one and then this one here, the big one. It seems like this is exclusively Prop 13. Okay. Um, which is the school bond measure. But I was going through this and looking at it and I, I hadn't really sat down yet mm-hmm. to go through it. I might do a podcast just on that, mm-hmm. me filling out my ballot. Right. Um, it's hard to know where to get information. I've had friends who host parties and everybody comes over and they say, OK, who knows about this judge? Who has information or who feels really strongly about these candidates? And yeah. people go around and they disagree. Really? Oh, yeah. Well, that's yeah. an interesting concept. Um, but, you know, now everybody's online and you don't get together as yeah. often. Um, and so that was actually a lot of fun because then you could get somebody that would say, I actually worked with this person. No. <laughs> and if you trust them and their judgment, yeah. then you kind of believe that. Or I worked with this person or I know them and their ethics are 
um, you know, impeccable or, you know, they, they are very sharp and they're going to do the right thing or they know an issue very well. They can really argue it from one mm -hmm. standpoint or another. Um, yeah. Now I think people kind of rely on Facebook and that's just a very different type of discussion. Ooh. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, yeah. And so now you I'm a registered no party preference. Is that a, same with me? Oh, OK. So I had to request the Democratic ballot. And I um, chose not to request oh, it. Oh, really? Why? Yeah. Well, because I'm not ultimately supportive of any of those candidates. Mm -hmm. And so I figured, well, why vote in the primary if mm -hmm. I wouldn't vote for any of them in the in the general? Mm -hmm. I don't support Trump either. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, I mean, if I had to vote for one of them, mm -hmm. I would probably vote for Yang and he's out. I know. And, you know, <laughs> Steve, my husband has his math. What is it? The Yang Club or yeah, well, make, <laughs> make math great again. No, he loves make that. America think harder. Yes. Yeah, yeah. That's what that is. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I, I didn't request the, the ballot for the president race and I figured, well, you know, it, it is what it is it's mm -hmm. good, and we'll see how it rolls out. Yeah. So, I mean, tell me what your thoughts on the presidential ticket. What do you think? Oof. Um, you know, I do believe that Trump needs to be defeated. Right. Um, the examples that we're seeing first, the lying is just, you know, Steve wrote a book about the 15 reasons people <laughs> vote for Trump and he That's took a, a very academic book. approach yeah. to yes. this is why people said he's going to yes. strengthen the military and here's what's actually happened. And mm -hmm. he, his book published before, um, the, the stuff with the Kurds and, you know, just some of the outrageous national security, um, and really hits to, the military in terms of oh, yeah. their own, you know, their their purpose and their feelings about the way they do very difficult work. So he takes this very, you know, I, I'm just more like, this is bullshit. Like <laughs> he's lying. And there's that's okay. you know, that's that's all well, there is. You know yeah. when somebody's lying to yeah. you and this is just like compulsive. Right. Um and it's very concerning because it, you know, you you see a lot of the Republican senators and um members of Congress just following suit and just, mm -hmm. you know, it, it is kind of a, a cult, really a group think mentality, and it's acting out of fear, being afraid fear of having somebody huge. tweet at you. But there are people yeah. who are afraid for their safety. Yes. Um, there are people who have real fears that don't compare to a congressman who might have somebody boo them. Um, and so that has just, I think, put our country in a really negative place where we have grown accustomed to behavior that uh, a few years ago, I think we would have all agreed was just, you know, something you would see in some, you know, dictatorship in some <laughs> crazy country, but it's some not us. Some sci-fi oh dystopian my gosh, movie. Absolutely. I mean, who was that Gaddafi <laughs> that would come out dressed in gold with his Swedish bodyguards? And yeah. The whole thing was just ludicrous. And you would never think that is what we are doing here, or that's what's become at least tolerated, um, not by the majority of Americans, but by a small minority that is just hunkering down. And again, you get this group think, and I understand they're under attack and the attacks aren't always fair. I try to look at things both ways. Trump is not the worst person that mm -hmm. there has ever been, um, but this is terrible behavior. It really is. And, and studies are coming out and showing that it's, you know, children in schools that are now being subject mm -hmm. to um, some of these things, uh, attacking people if they're Hispanic or Latino, Jewish yeah. um, people, yeah. mm -hmm. women. Mm -hmm. you know, it's just um, obviously people who for their different faith. Um, so what I think about the presidential race is that this is the time for the United States and for Americans to step up and say four years of this insanity has been enough. Um, we need to rebuild from that. I think the Republican Party has its own challenges to contend with. Um, a lot of people are leaving the party and becoming what they consider independent or no party preference. Mm -hmm. um, but the Democratic side is so frustrating. Well, let's let's take a look at that field because I'm interested in your take. Who do you think has the best chance to beat Trump? Who do you think is the likely nominee? And who are you most supportive of? So I've been a Bernie fan from the earliest days. Right. Just taking somebody who is consistent, mm -hmm. that says a lot to me. Yeah, that they're not listening to extraordinarily consistent. Yeah, they're not listening to consultants and mm -hmm. they're pretty basic things. I'm not afraid of the label of socialism for the reasons that I described. Right. There are a lot of aspects of, of American society that are socialist. We pay taxes, people get benefits, it's we have a mixed Medicare. Economy. Exactly. So mm -hmm. the labels 
don't freak me out like they do other people. I don't think we're going to turn into <laughs> it's Venezuela. Not like, it's not like McCarthyism or something. Right? Course, communist, <laughs> right? I mean, yeah. So, you know, um, right. there are different uh, layers to things. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I don't know. I was very concerned when he had a heart attack. That is a concrete oh, Bernie, reality. Yeah. yeah, that's right. And at that point, I was looking at Elizabeth Warren, uh -huh. who I think, uh, you know, she's a former Republican. Yeah. Um, so that, that uh, you know, bothers a lot of people. It doesn't bother me well, at all. Well, think about that. That's funny because Bloomberg is a former Republican. Republican, Trump was a Trump's former, a former De Democrat. Democrat. Yeah. <laughs> so again, the labels. And yeah. I and I one thing I will give Trump credit for is I think he has broken down the walls of all these different labels. That's good. I um, agree. You know, but he's also speaking of walls, erected and put up and and strengthened just crazy things that you thought were dying with, you know, that's your crazy uncle or yeah. somebody who's <laughs> never going to change and yeah. the views are from another time when right. people never had met a person of a different faith. Um, but a lot of things I think are just, you know, you see them more um, or I think he's the first atheist president. There's no question about that. He's, you know, he says, oh, I'm with the Christians and he'll go to church every now and then. But then he says things that make it clear his belief system seems to be wholly self-consumed. I mean, he is just a narcissist and he is at the center of his world. And I think there was that interview where he said, why would I ever ask for forgiveness? And yeah. he laughs as people are praying over him. Yeah. Um, that's a whole fascinating thing, I think, to think about. And separation of church and state is very important. Um, at the same time, though, he, he has his personal advisor, spiritual advisor. I mean, yeah. Paula, I forget her last name who literally, these are televangelists that are bleeding people dry of their money right. and telling them they will go to hell and bad things will happen to you if you don't send me a $1,000. And, <laughs> you know, you plant that seed and uh -huh. your enemies will be struck down and you'll win the lottery or who knows, you know, they promise different things or they bully them into it. Um, that is just something we've got to grow out of, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what our tax dollars are being spent for right now. When we have such a need for future planning and implementation, instead we have people that are in the White House, that are, you know, living off of our federal taxes, mm -hmm. doing who knows what. Um, that's very troubling. So Elizabeth Warren, for me, seems she has a plan, right? Mm -hmm. Until she didn't have a plan for some of the more complex right. um, health care uh, programs. But she's clearly capable. Mm -hmm. um, she's she somebody, I think, who you know, heading the, I forgot the name of the so Department of Consumer, Consumer Protection. Protection Bureau. Yeah. Think, yeah. I mean, that that is so important because mm -hmm. I really feel like people don't understand understand um, the threats that are posed by cybersecurity. We're at a different level of um, people being able to steal your identity, um, you know, steal uh, financial crimes yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that are done electronically. Yeah. Um, it, there, really, consumer protection is just so important, and that department has really been watered down. Um, so I think Elizabeth Warren is very strong. However, she wrote it a little bit. And the she whole, has. Yeah. And the whole whatever, whatever consultants gave her the advice to try to make it into a woman can't be elected and get into that whole thing with Bernie, I think, was ill-advised. Um, Amy Klobuchar, I think, is is just steadily rising. Yeah. And she's somebody I mean, at this point, I'd be OK with Amy Klobuchar. Um, she's like the tortoise in the hair, right? Yeah. Just it's like just a responsible like, adult yeah. who's not blatantly racist and not breaking the law and lying to the American public. And maybe let's have press conferences again, you know, once a month or once a quarter. I don't <laughs> think we've had a press conference from the White House in over oh, 300 days. And forever. Um, and that's where the public needs to ask questions. And that's where the administration needs to answer those questions. But we don't even expect that anymore. Um, Pete Buttigieg, I think, is having issues. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. And so I don't know that he's the person that I would, you know, really put my my heart and soul behind. Joe Biden, I think, is just um, is not the future candidate, not the person who's going to lead yeah, us yeah. into the future. Yeah. That's unfortunate. I think he's obviously a, you know, honorable person. Um, the whole thing about his son and, and, you know, that was effective, I think, for the um, very troubling tactics that we're seeing right. on the Republican side. I saw a joke headline that, uh, um, on online, and it said, for everybody that donates to the Biden campaign, they'll get a free America Online CD. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, because he's like yeah. from an era yeah. long ago, yeah. you know. And um, I'm a huge believer. I mean, the, the projects that I've worked on um, and the technology investments that I have seen work very well are when you do have your millennials or your 20 year olds, mm -hmm. your young, um, you know, the, the throwing everything at at the project and they have skills that uh, others don't have. 
teamed up with somebody in their 60s, even in their 70s, yeah. with the wisdom and the connections. Yes. That says a lot of knowing mm -hmm. who to team up with for a pilot project or knowing where to get your next round of funding, not just because it's the dollar amount, but because it's the right partner. Um, so, you know, I was 25 years old when I came on board with GovPartner, mm -hmm. and I was working very closely with engineering firms. And a lot of these were retired city managers, retired city mm -hmm. engineers. And that combination to go out and talk to other cities about the internet. Your permits are gonna be processed online. Service requests are now going to be, we weren't even thinking about mobile phones at that point. Eventually, of course, we moved into mobile technology. Uh, that was the right approach. And I always think that that's the best approach if you don't have it all be from one generation or another. Um, and so that's, you know, I, we can joke about, and I loved your OK Boomer <laughs> episode. <laughs> I get mad at that. My kids call me a boomer, and I say, I'm not a boomer. I'm Generation yeah, X. Yeah, me too, you know? Yeah, and I figured out with one of my son's little friends, like, what's the equivalent that you can say to kids? And I'm like, guys, help me out here. What do I say to kids when they're calling me a boomer? And they said, OK, buddy. OK, little buddy. Uh, and so now people say, OK, boomer. I go, OK, little buddy. <laughs> and they get really mad. Like, so it's you have fun with that stuff, yeah, I think. You can't get too right. upset. Um, but I just, you know, and I think we're seeing that uh, with the with the votes with Iowa. Iowa was a whole disaster. And honestly, Ugh. I think it didn't honestly didn't surprise people. The people that I know that work in election technology, um, I remember interviewing an executive quite a few years ago, and this was I think even b before Trump won. And he just said, "We have uh, so much access now and visibility into our process of democracy." that people are going to be very surprised by what actually works, how it works, and how mm -hmm. it doesn't work, right. especially young people mm -hmm. who did believe one vote is one vote, and we elect people based on who got the most votes. And then it's like, well, not exactly. A vote is different than a superdelegate. Well, we saw that in Iowa. Of course. You know, where Bernie won the, the popular, but Buttigieg got the most delegates, right? We think. Uh, yeah, we think. Honestly, there didn't uh, uh, Perez, the guy who heads up the Democratic Party, ask for a recount? And, yeah, you know, Perez. that was that was a valid point. We're, we, we're counting votes in a gym. Yeah. And why are people out there with their kids crying at midnight, running from one group to another? You know, there was that voter that voted for Buttigieg and then found out he was gay and wanted her little card back. <laughs> I saw that. It's just the whole thing. You know, democracy is messy, and that's part of well, what it, does make it great. But... Um, it's it's a little bit depressing to see this is, um, you know, this is the way that we are making important decisions and that we're supposed to be inspiring the world. Yeah. Well, I think they're clinging to old traditions in mm -hmm. Iowa with these caucuses where technology has taken us to a place where we could still have that. You know, the, the way they have first choice, second choice, you could still do ranked choice voting mm -hmm. on a ballot, you know, mm -hmm. and, and and not have to, like, take off time from work or home and kids right. and snowstorms. I mean, you just do it, you know, and mm -hmm. mail it in. But so who do you think is going to win the Democratic nomination? Oh, I mean, I'm not a you know, I think if if you've learned anything, it's not to predict. I think Bernie Sanders could win. And I hear people that are very concerned. And, you know, he's another Trump in terms of a cult personality. Yeah. Um, the whole Bernie bro, you know, oh my gosh, they're being mean to me on Twitter. You know, I've had my <laughs> share of attacks from every right. side. So it's like, give me a break. Again, you're mm -hmm. not really suffering anything like people who really have challenges because somebody's being mean to you or because you open Twitter and you have 500 or 5,000, um, you know, nasty comments. Like you can ignore that. Um, I think he could, and, and he really does seem to have that staying power and his own base of support. And they keep comparing him. If you take the moderates, all four of them against Bernie, then it shows you people really are moderate. Well, I mean, now he's you're, you're mm -hmm. comparing him to eight others. And I think it's just very funny how they're like, the big winner is Klobuchar for coming in third. Third is more important than first. Because of his exceeding expectations is what that's Yes, mm -hmm. but at the same time, who are we going to pick? What is going to be the process? Um, do we stick to democratic principles? Um, and do we then put ourselves in a position where we are not able to defeat Trump? And that's what I think everybody's afraid of. And so enter Mike Bloomberg. Exactly. Right? Yeah, right. Um, but is it OK for Bloomberg to be elected through tactics that we said were not idealistic or we're not true democracy. Agreed. Right. Yeah. So, you know, enough money and you're in. There are a lot of problems. I mean, I, I again look at, 
there are statements and actions that Bloomberg has taken in the past, and they're not just statements that hurt people of color. It was a reality of people living in New York, and you see a lot of comments where um, African Americans say these were our kids, and these were our kids in a group of friends that were the ones getting pulled aside, frisked, you know, patted down. It's very hurtful. I feel like we don't really understand how hurtful it is for people to now mm -hmm. hear the validation of yes, you were being targeted, and yes, it was assumed that it was better to put young African Americans or Latinos in prison because they're going to commit a crime right. anyway. Um, but kids in Rancho Bernardo or in nice areas, um, if they commit the same crime, we were going to help them out because they have to go to college, and yeah. these are our future leaders. It's a they're, not, standard, they're not really doing anything wrong. That is, that is just so hurtful on such a visceral level. Um, well, stop and frisk is also a violation of the Fourth Amendment. It's a, yeah. You know, it's it's search without warrant, without probable cause. It's just mm -hmm. racial profiling. It's terrible. And yeah. I, I experienced some of that when I lived in Washington, D.C. Um, and there was a friend who came from a very wealthy family in Beverly mm -hmm. Hills. Again, this was UCLA doing internships in D.C. Um, but he was I think um, his mom was white and his father was African-American black. Um, and he would constantly get stopped on the metro for riding our bikes in Georgetown, going to a party. The neighbors would call the police. Obviously, that kid stole that bike. Jeez. And it was just wow. horrific. I mean, it was just you yeah. saw his reaction to it, just destroying somebody's yeah. sense of worth and, and yeah. belief in the world as a place that's safe and fair. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, again, I look at Bernie Sanders. He has consistently been on the right side and he has known what is right and wrong. Um, even though people say, well, that was a different time and Bloomberg was just operating when everybody thought this way. Well, I look at, no, not everybody. Maybe yeah. everybody in a certain echelon. And yeah. that, there you had Trump saying these, uh, the Central Park Five should be put to death. Well, and Trump supports stop and frisk. Yeah, still, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but now he's going to probably play that he's not because Trump's always on both Who sides. Who knows, exactly. I don't even, so I mean, can you can't even Sanders listen can Sanders beat Trump? I don't know if he can um, get the Democratic Party to to uh, fall behind him. So he may not even win the nomination. I think he could win the nomination, uh, but have a fractured Democratic Party yeah. who still just, you know, just refuses to uh, support him. Who yeah. knows? There's going to be. Then, I don't know. Maybe then we end up Trump was was fine. <laughs> you know, it's There's, just it's going to be a lot of drama coming up. I, I think that. Uh, um, the only way Bernie wins, as long as all the, the moderate candidates, if none of them drop out. Mm -hmm. So as long as they don't coalesce around one of them, then I think Bernie has a shot. I always contend Bernie has a ceiling. Like there's like he has a limited amount of support mm -hmm. within the Democratic Party. Um, but if he wins, that would be a very – it'd be a, a – very interesting race between Bernie and Trump. But mm -hmm. if it turned out to be Bernie or, and Trump, then someone like Bloomberg would probably enter as an independent and maybe throw yeah. things another right. way. So there's potentially a lot of drama. Right. It's fascinating. And at the end of the day, all we want is to not pay the most in health care for the worst results. Yeah, of course. I mean, they're, you yeah. know, they're very yeah. simple things. And I don't know that Bernie Sanders has the end all solution, nor Elizabeth Warren, nor Klobuchar. Um, but that is the challenge that we face as a nation. Oh, no doubt. I have no faith in the Trump administration. I just, you know, the people that he has leading federal departments, Betsy DeVos, it took <laughs> the vote from Mike Pence to push her in there. Yeah. Because even Republicans couldn't support voting for somebody so unqualified right. to lead our Department of Education. Right. Um, you know, and then before that, you had Rick Perry saying he was going to abolish these five departments. Nobody, education, I think, was one of them. Yes. And then he couldn't even remember during that debate which departments he was going it, to abolish. But I, and ironically, I think he wanted to abolish education, commerce, and energy. And then he ended up right. being the secretary right. of energy. And he didn't realize that that included, like, <laughs> nuclear energy. He's just like, I just wanted to, you know, see where the contracts are going to go yeah. for the oil companies. <laughs> I don't care about the nuclear bomb. Someone else can be in charge. I mean, yeah. it's, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if this much visibility is um, just, you know, society has moved into a different era of enlightenment. We can see a lot more. We can. The yeah. tweets, you know, I'm sure Obama was not, you know, saying perfect things. And if you were in his mind and he was impulsive enough to be tweeting on a regular basis, we wouldn't be horrified at some of what we saw. Certainly with George Bush, he would sometimes blurt things out and it was unpresidential. <laughs> um, so maybe that's just a factor of the yeah. moment that we're in. But it's um, it's very unconcerning, especially the corruption. And you see that in the 
um, you know, interior department. You know, Steve's uh, great great grandfather, uncle, was the first secretary of the interior. Really? And he was the secretary of the treasury, and he was in the room when uh, Abraham Lincoln died. Uh, so there's just really, this, yeah, oh yeah, wow. I know. He, 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 we talk a lot with um, our boys about um, one of my 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 great grandfather actually was the first uh, conservative congressman in Mexico from ah. the Bond Party, not the first one that was elected, but the first one that the uh, voters insisted serve. He was a beloved doctor and others had been elected, but they would just say, no, he didn't really win. And then they wouldn't serve. <laughs> right. He was elected and, and he was, you know, he f- was forced to, he will serve or the, the people demanded Because the dominant him. party there forever was the PLI, right? The PRI. Yeah. Okay. Which is, I think it's, uh, it's like the party of the people. Okay. And my family was always, uh, I hope I'm getting these right, but the pun, very conservative, the oh, Catholic wow. church, wow. Um, very elitist, honestly. Oh, okay. Um, and that was, you know, President Vicente Fox. Oh, yeah. Um, my grandfather went on to, um, you know, support Fox and, and I have pictures. Um, have you, know. you followed Fox's tweets? I love Fox's tweets. <laughs> he's fantastic. <laughs> you know, he's, he's like, calling Trump, him, Trump, mira, te voy a decir. <laughs> yeah. And he's like flipping the bird at Trump and all. You know, he's awesome. That is so, yeah, I guess that, I was going to say that is so. <laughs> not what I know of Mexico. Everything is proper manners. Yeah. Um, you know, you, but <laughs> yeah, the, then the men start talking and, the, you know, the women don't say bad words. Right. The men will. Um, <laughs> and now, it, yeah, that was part of why uh, I think my mom wanted to come to the United States. She was actually born in Los Angeles. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, my, my grandfather fell in love with, a you know, a young woman, my grandmother from oh, Los Angeles. Nice. And moved here for a while. But then it really was that, you know, his family had businesses and investments mm-hmm. and it really was in Mexico. Um, but he would come and do a lot of the machines that he would buy for his factory were from Germany. So that's how we ended up in San Diego. He would come and do the business dealings wow. here and in Houston. Think about your children and like all of these international exposure, cultural. Right. I mean, you were just saying you were you were just in Copenhagen mm-hmm. and, and Germany and, and it was it, it was Norway, right? In Norway, yeah. In Norway. And now Mexico. Wow. That's, yeah. What an opportunity My mom's children. cousin uh, married a Norwegian. Uh, they were studying at Whittier College or okay. Whittier University. Uh, and she fell in love with a Norwegian. He was there studying economics. And That's they, where Nixon went to school. That is exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and they moved back to Oslo and have lived there ever since. And she worked for the prime minister. Wow. Um, speaks many languages. You know, now, of course, um, they're both retired. Um, but they travel, you know, the world. My one of my cousins is like a professional golfer, so they spent some time wow. in Florida. And it's it is very. I think it's so important, and it's such a the biggest gift that we could give our kids was one the Spanish language. So I put them in Valley Elementary for that dual language immersion yeah. to speak Spanish. Is that working out well? Oh, fantastic. Oh, I mean, right it's, yeah, now, of course, Evan is learning uh, German oh, cool. because he, I'm sure, will go and study, you know, live a summer with his cousins in Germany mm, and they're mm. going to come here. One of his cousins is in New Zealand right now. So 17 years old, he's off to live in New Zealand for six months. I don't know that I would be OK with that. But again, it's just the different mentality of how you raise your kids and what you expose them to. But the gift of traveling the world and just seeing how, you know, what Iceland is like and what Costa Rica is like and different parts of Mexico. uh, I think it's just very helpful then when you look at your situation in Rancho Bernardo or in Poway. Um, Some people say, you know, my my stepdad is a good example. We say, let's go to Italy. I didn't lose anything in Italy. You know, what do I have to do in Italy? And he's a Vietnam combat veteran. So he has seen the world, but in a different way. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, traveling is not his favorite thing. But we, you know, my parents, we took them to Iceland and that was just, you know. I saw some of your photos online. That was spectacular. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It really, really just... You learn a lot about yourself as you are learning about other cultures and other ways of life. Um, I, I had a chance to go to South Africa when I was on the board of Habitat for Humanity, and I was young. I was maybe 21, 22. I remember coming back and just like, why do we have all this stuff? And <laughs> these kids have you know, the poverty, but they have community, and they're together. And I see the kids from a lot of um, you know, the, the people that I know here, and they're isolated, and there's a lot of depression. Yeah. Um, they have everything. Um, but they have very little in other ways. Um, so I think that's uh, that's also what our society is contending with. How expensive were things in Iceland? I've heard that it's really it's really expensive. Is that true? Yeah. Um, you know, we flew into 
Reykjavik. Yeah. And then we f- then we took another flight after a few days there up to Akureyri. Mm-hmm. Um, so the hotels and the flights were not as expensive as I thought. But the meals are expensive, right? Yeah. I mean, if you're going to have fresh vegetables, you know, I mean, that's just not something that a lot of seafood. Yeah. We didn't taste the whale. I wasn't interested in eating whale blubber. <laughs> right. So there were some things that were not as expensive, mm-hmm. but things like a salad, um, you, the, that's just not a country that Oh, it's all going to be imported. Agriculture. Yeah. Exactly. Um, you know, it wasn't as expensive as I thought it was going to be, uh-huh. but maybe I was just expecting everything to be wow. outrageous. But anything that they purchase, um, you know, like a coat, you buy your coat for life. And so it's going to be expensive, but very well made. Um, they don't have a lot of like the throwaway culture, I feel like, where we buy things and, you know, it breaks in your hands, made in China and, and you never use it again. <laughs> yeah, um, there's a lot of that. I, I definitely got a sense that the furniture is very well made, the clothing that you see. As a tourist, it wasn't um, it wasn't that bad. It was, um, you know, we they have obviously the Blue Lagoon and the uh, geothermal baths. Oh, yeah. They had the geothermal plant. They actually have a really nice restaurant on the top of it. They call it the Pearl. And of course, Steve's an engineer. I work with a lot of inventors mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. entrepreneurs. And so for us to go see a water treatment plant, or at the time, it was also for all the Bitcoin uh, oh. cryptocurrencies where you needed server farms that were you know, oh, crunching really? the algorithm. There was a lot of investment in Iceland wow. because you have the geothermal energy, but then you don't have to worry as much about the cooling. So they had server farms, basically. Oh, interesting. So that's just like all the stuff that we love to see. I would love to. You know, can you imagine if we had a fancy restaurant at one of our like wastewater treatment plants or at the water plant? It's like it's this thing that you go see. It's this incredible yeah. feat of infrastructure and engineering that the community embraces and is proud of. Well, in, in Escondido, we have a nice restaurant and an auto dealership. That's I know. I know the Cohen family. <laughs> yeah. Right. That was very creative of them. Yeah. So that's, again, the types of things where we can do things differently. We can do things, I think, in a much better way. But we have a very hard time getting away from the labels. And it's a lot of um, Mm -hmm. fear-based just inability to see anything being done in a different way, to see a person that looks different than you and to think that they can be trusted or that they could even do something that will help you right. versus they, they look like this. I've heard this about them, this type of person, and they're dangerous. They're going to hurt me. They're going to like destroy the fabric of society. <laughs> I hear that all the time when I'm in the Midwest. Build a wall. Gabby, you don't understand the fabric of society. I'm yeah. like, what is... What What are you talking about? (laughs) You know, you're hurting young kids when you're, you know, Mm -hmm. being bigoted and saying that a a gay person, you know, is not allowed to love who they love and is not allowed to be a leader. Yeah. That's what I try to tell people. Like, why are you doing this to young people Mm -hmm. who are trying to grow and contribute to society? And, you know, they, they deserve better than these bigoted, uh, you know, I, I feel like just racism is just stupid above all. Oh, it's completely stupid. Because you make decisions and you trust people that end up hurting you. Yeah. (laughs) But then you can't believe it because they look the way you thought or they're part of the tribe that you thought was perfect. Right. Um, That's one thing I teach my kids. And from a very young age, remember the Sandusky? um, Was that Penn State or Penn? Yeah, Penn State. Yeah, yeah. And I remember showing them. And I mean, we we grew up in the Catholic Church, but Steve and I are no longer, Mm -hmm. you know, attend Catholic Church. And I wasn't about to put my kids in Sunday school. I just wasn't comfortable leaving them, you know, with everything that was happening, unfortunately, with the Catholic Church. But I would show them, like, look at this man, because it was all over the news, and he's the coach, and he's the Mm -hmm. star, and... Um, but he was hurting little kids and he looks like somebody that you could trust and he looks like the hero, but he was doing things he wasn't supposed yeah, to be doing. Right, right. And yeah, you know, I remember Steve said he was at the grocery store when Obama was elected president soon after. Yeah. And this was here in Poway. And there was a picture of um, African-American on the cover of a magazine. Mm-hmm. And he said, uh, the boy said, oh, is he also a president? And there was an African-American older man standing in front of Steve. And because I think they said, who's that black man? Is he a president, too? And the man turned around and Steve said they kind of caught eyes. And it was like a rapper on the, you know, the cover of something. (laughs) But he said you could tell in the man's face, like, wow, this generation is seeing an African-American person can be a president. Yeah can be a good person, mm-hmm. they're not seeing it and negative and, and automatically associating it with something negative. Right. And that's just something that comes through, um, you know, the lived experience and what we convey to the younger generation, even the little toddlers, they pick up on some of these things that we're, everybody's We're making saying. progress forward. Every once in a while we go backwards, right? Oh, but I think overall we're moving forward. 
I hope so. I mean, you gotta things are better now than you know when Martin Luther King was you know leading you know marches and trying to change society. We've improved. Mm-hmm. We haven't improved enough. Um, it's certainly better than it was 150 years ago. Well, yeah. we're at a very precarious time. And mm-hmm. when we were in Germany, you know, we visited the Brandenburg Gate in Berlin. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. where, you know, the Ronald Reagan oh, <laughs> famously yeah. said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down tear this wall. wall. Yeah. <laughs> and I was there with, you know, some uh, German dignitaries mm-hmm. and some of them are international judges. Um, and one of them said, I was here as a boy when it was still Eastern and Western um, Mm -hmm. Germany. And he said, what we're seeing from the United States right now, and particularly from our ambassador to Germany, Richard Mm -hmm. Grinnell or Rick Grinnell, you know, a DeMaio friend, he's from San Diego. Like this is what we're sending to Germany. And he's empowering white nationalism. And they're very, very disturbed in Germany. Like, why are you sending this person and why is he stoking, yeah. you know, what formerly was the Nazi party? These aren't just memes and this isn't, yeah. you know, you're you're overreacting. Um, they are very concerned because they know how dangerous and how quickly things can escalate and how dangerous it can become. Yes. Um, and that was very sad for me where it was, you know, like, yeah, this, this is what we are bringing to other parts of the world. And... Um, this, the, this fringe, you know, state of mind, this fringe thought is now becoming, you know, more accepted. Of course. They, they've been given sort of a, what do they say? They, they've been given uh, the opportunity to come out of their closet. It's very fine people on both sides. So they I don't get, even yeah, think right. it's people coming out of the closet. It's people who could have been presented with different belief systems and pathways uh-huh. to improve their own lives right. and are being given this path. That is very dangerous. And that yeah. comes back in the uh-huh. form of we had the shooting at the synagogue. Oh, my God. Yeah. I read that manifesto. It was it was well written to a certain point. Then it got into why would I kill a young person just because of their religion and literally explaining this is why it's OK to shoot children or people oh that God. you don't know. Yeah. And this is a you know a young man who was raised in Poway Unified Schools. Yeah. This is one of our kids. I yeah. look at it in that way. And this is somebody who, and again, mental health problems, of course, if you're getting to the point where you're inflicting violence of that type and you're having these crazy thoughts, but it seems less crazy when you're hearing it come. I mean, we've got, what is it, Richard? I forgot his name, Stephen Miller in the White House. Oh, and, yeah. I yeah, mean, yeah. some of the, you know, some of the email communications and what they... Um, what they unapologetically will speak to and believe in. And Bannon spoke to a lot of these things of this is effective and this is um, what we believe. And so I always um, have that saying of when somebody shows you who they are, believe them. Right. Don't think that just because they're from your tribe or because they look nice and they are, you know, in a country club and wearing nice clothes, Mm -hmm. uh, that they don't really mean the things that they're saying. And these are things that are very dangerous for society. No question. No doubt. Um, We can go down this path deep. But what I like to do, because our time is limited, I want to talk a little more about local issues. And, And, you know, we've got You know, things going on with the city of San Diego and the mayor, and we've got things going on with the Poway Unified School District, which you just mentioned. So let's dabble a little bit there. So where would you like to start? Well, let's start with Poway Unified, right? That's the, because interestingly enough, it's not just the city of Poway. A lot of people don't realize the schools are in the city of San Diego. I live in Rancho Bernardo, but we are in the Poway Unified School District. Right. Um, And so, you know, that's a... The big talk on next door and the you know superintendent is right. out making the case and you're not allowed to campaign mm-hmm. for a, a proposition. You're allowed to educate. So there's a fine line that is walked there. But I did attend the session and I went to Valley. I want I love that school. Okay. Um, so I went and listened to the superintendent's presentation there. Um, I did not realize the state of disrepair, uh, how bad it has gotten. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. My son goes to Rancho Bernardo High School, our oldest son. Uh, and yeah, I mean, the school's not falling apart and it's not the worst thing that you've ever seen, but certainly it has not been maintained, I think, to the standards that you would hope. And the community is wondering why it has not been maintained, given that there was the cab 
uh, bond or what is it? The capital appreciation. I guess it is a bond that you yeah, call capital it. Capital appreciation bond cap. Yeah. Um, you know, where did that money go? Right. right fair and that, point. that was only a hundred million in terms of the amount of money, but it was 900 million in terms of the amount of interest. Yes. That is going to be paid. That right. hasn't even kicked in yet. No, we don't pay start paying for that for a little over 10 years from now. I know. I know. Some of the students that graduated, I think when the, when that was passed, maybe mm -hmm. they're paying for it now. Oh, Here's Nona, your puppy. Nona's Hi. coming to visit again. <laughs> um, yeah, so that money job. was spent like in 2012, 2013, 2014 mm -hmm. um, to, re, to you know, revamp some of the schools. That's a fair question. You know, why are the, the, they do have legitimate problems? There mm -hmm. are leaky roofs and broken mm -hmm. air conditioning systems. But why is it not being repaired? Right. You know, and they say we don't get any money from the state for repairs. Well, I mean, all of the state money is now in one pot. And so you certainly can use money from your general fund and other schools, yeah. other school districts do use that to fix things that are going to become worse and more costly. Right. This school district has chosen to spend the money on other things. Yeah, they get $400 million a year. Right, right. And, you know, and so I've always contended that if you have leaky roofs and broken air conditioning and heating systems... Well, fix it. Of course. You and know, that's a high it gets priority. Worse, right. Yeah. Before it becomes a bigger problem. Exactly. That's called maintenance. Right. So you want to be proactive and you want to be smart in the way that you're maintaining, just like you do your home. Yeah. You don't just let a leaky roof. You're going to have to replace more of the roof. Right. Uh, yeah. So, I, you know, I think the community is so upset <laughs> and, and at the way that things have been mismanaged. Right. And at the decisions in the past. And the trust is just not there. Yeah, huge. Yeah. Um, it's very hard. Again, my son is in the school that needs the repairs. Right. Um, and so I yeah, I personally have at Valley, the teachers had all of their books on the floor. And there was an engineering firm that I work with that was moving offices and had beautiful bookcases. Mm -hmm. um, and so I finally I went and found a moving company that day and moved 12 bookshelves. Um, you know, like this is it. They're going to get rid of it. But if, if I can move it there today, coordinated with the principal and the staff and it was, you know, so like we spend money and, and the community gives to these schools. Yes. Um, and, and some have the ability to do that. But for the school district to say we're now going to find out if the community cares about kids and if the community cares about schools, whether, you know, by the decision of passing this measure is just, I, it just is offensive to me. Of course, we care about kids and schools. Mm -hmm. um, and I would give the money either way, whether it's through additional property taxes or whatever the kids need or mm -hmm. the school, I'm happy to donate it. Um, you know, we, we fund the, the foundations and I was on the board of the foundation at Valley Elementary and that's where we started seeing all the problems with the iPads. And mm -hmm. again, where are they spending the money? Mm -hmm. um, so it's a very difficult, uh, do we need it? I think we do need the funding, but we shouldn't have gotten to this point. That's the problem. That's right. You're and I absolutely right. Yeah. And at that at that session, my because it was funny, uh, not funny. It's actually terrible. The superintendent was showing in this many years, if we don't make these repairs, the schools are going to all be red, uninhabitable. And people said, well, what's going to happen then? She said, well, I don't know. I guess the state will take over. I mean, it's like worst case scenario. And she said, and this is the absolute worst case scenario that's looming on us. And then, you know, I raised my hand and said, actually, I think the worst case scenario is that we pass this measure, the money gets misspent and it, it not spent wisely, and we still have everything go into yeah. disrepair. And yet all the money, you know, w was not um, used to fix and to, and to make the repairs needed. That's actually the worst case scenario. Um, and I asked what measures have been put into place. You, keep, you know, everybody says it's all different people. It's not all different people. But what measures have been put into place to show us that the money will be spent wisely? And these are just whether it's some sort of controls procedures or what kind of a you say technology in classrooms, what technology in what classrooms mm -hmm. when, you know, people come to investors asking for money. You don't just say I'm building an app. <laughs> or I'm going to have a service yeah. and it'll generally be in this. It's like, no, mm -hmm. what, what's the where is the actual plan and who is going to actually do the implementation? Um, and the answer was uh, what we have is our reputation. And she said, the superintendent, you know, what is different now? Well, I have my reputation and I'm putting it here that it will be done right. And that's unfortunately doesn't carry as much weight as maybe that would carry, you know, in the past. People just can't trust 
Yeah. Based on, well, people come and go and the money's mis- misused. And this could be just the latest person that, you know, comes and goes. So it's very difficult. Well, it's interesting how you say it's offensive the way they present it. And I agree because when you're talking about children and schools, it can get emotional. You know, children are kind of used as these props Mm -hmm. and these political arguments. They need the money to fix the facilities. There's no question. Right, the need is there. And that's clear. But then they frame it where they say, well, if, if you don't pass this bond, you know, in 10 years, we're going to have dilapidated, condemned schools or, you know, your home values are going to be suffering and all these kind of threats. But if it was really about the children, then we right. would have prioritized the f- fixing of the roofs and the heating systems before the superintendent got a, a raise and a, an extension on the contract, before all these union workers got more and more raises. Before you had more associate superintendents, before you added more PR resources yes. and assistance for this and for that. So it's a matter of prioritization. Right. And it is very it is very difficult because I will say the teachers at Poway Unified are among the highest qualified, yeah, no, very no good dispute. at what they do. Mm-hmm. Um, and nobody wants to say that they don't deserve to be paid. Teachers in general, right, are not valued enough in our society. That's another thing where we get to other countries versus in the United States. But they keep saying they deserve raises, and they do deserve raises, and they've negotiated automatic raises, Mm -hmm. from what I believe. We're doing raises on top of raises, yes, and we're doing buyouts. And it's um, it just comes to a point where the role of a trustee is to look at the money that is available and to look at the need across the board. The union's job is to push for as much, um, you know, money and benefits for their members, and they're doing their job. Yeah, it's the trustees' job that are elected by the public to make the right decisions and to say, we would like to do more, but this is all we are able to do. But they have a conflict of interest because they're endorsed by that union. Of course. And so they have to do quid pro quo and give back to the union for the support that they got from the union in the election. And I don't think it's a conflict. It's not a conflict of interest structurally because you could have, and you had that in Charles Sellers and you had that in Trustee Beatty. Those are rare cases. Where they said- Fine, you can come to the meetings and boo us and wear shirts and attack us, Mm -hmm. but we are still going to vote for the public good. We're still going to Mm -hmm. try to balance this budget. Um, And then you have TJ Zane, Michelle O'Connor Ratcliffe. I think Darsh Patel just kind of came in and followed, you know, what Mm -hmm. what the two of them were doing um, that decided not to do that. And it's the easy vote, I suppose. And when you have aspirations of higher office, it's the smart vote for your own future, (laughs) but it's not the responsible vote. And that's why we now, in a booming economy, are unable to balance the budget. We are in these structural budget deficits where that gap grows larger. What's going to happen if we fall into a recession and how many more tax increases are we going to request from the public. I I believe in measures that have a very specific investment and purpose. Yeah. Not to pay your maintenance needs. That is, that's just not structured correctly for the long-term health of an organization. Mm -hmm. But when the public says, we agree in this investment, it's going to be for this period of time, and we want to create these new, you know, buildings, or we want to bring something else to our uh, community, and we trust that the money's going to be spent wisely. That's not a bad thing. That's not what we have right now, though, unfortunately, with Measure P. T.J. Zane, the so-called fiscal conservative, the former executive chair of the Republican Party, is approving tax increases because he, he reluctantly says we need to do this. Mm-hmm. We need to tax people more. Approving structural deficits, mm-hmm. eroding our reserve, and he claims to be a champion for the taxpayer. And Tony Kovarik, his right-hand yeah. person, or he was the right-hand yeah. person to Kovarik, was at the meeting, sn- mm-hmm. falling over himself, taking photos of TJ, was re-elected, yeah. barely. I mean, he couldn't even get 50% of the vote in his tiny gerrymandered yeah. district that he has cultivated so carefully. All these years you know, working in the political machine, working for the party, working for the mm-hmm. Lincoln Club. Um, yeah, so they, they go and take the photos and... They claim that the unions are the worst thing and that they fight for the taxpayer, but that is not what their actions um, reveal. Exactly. So what do you know? <laughs> I guess you, you can't be all that surprised. Um, and it's just for people to, you know. So what are you going to do on Measure P? Are you going to vote yes or no? 
I think I'm going. I, th- I don't know, to be honest with you. Yeah. And uh, some you, people you have said conflicted. we need to rally and I don't want to push one way or the other. I think people need to make their own decisions. We need to see where the community is really at. Mm-hmm. I will tell you, I would be shocked if it passed. I agree. Because I don't know anybody who is voting for it. And what a sad position to be in if I decide, OK, I'm going to vote for it because it just suck it up and maybe it won't be spent you know, wisely, um, but maybe a portion of it will be. And maybe we're rewarding very bad decision making, mm-hmm. but it's for the kids ultimately. Um, and it's not like my kids will really benefit by the time they get their act together and actually, you know, make these repairs to Rancho Bernardo High School. I think my son will probably already be in college. Right. Um, but how sad to be in a position where you decide, OK, fine, I'm going to vote for it. We need we need to do something. And then it doesn't even pass. Um, that might be, you know, the situation that we're in. But I, I and I feel for people who are on fixed incomes. I think this would add maybe another two hundred dollars a year. I mean, the cabs are going to kick in, and at our rate, I think that's going to be maybe like six hundred dollars. Yeah. So that's really going to be a lot. Yeah. I'm, we're going to be in our house for another ten years. I mean, so you're asking for another two thousand dollars. You're asking for another. I mean, I'm already going to have to pay another six thousand dollars. That's not nothing. Of course. And that's money that some families really are hoping to invest to take their kids to college or to take them on a vacation right. or to make their own repairs on their own roof. Exactly. And so yeah. I really feel for people who don't have the money. And again, we're in a booming economy. You know, Economic patterns go up and down. And this is a lot. Um, it's it's not a small ask. No, not at all. I, I, I'm with you. I, I predict it won't pass, but I also predict that they're going to keep coming back mm-hmm. in future elections because that was the pattern 20 years ago. Well, right leading up to the billion dollar bond, they tried multiple times and they couldn't pass it because they needed two thirds. Mm-hmm. And then they changed the rule to 55 percent and then they eventually got it to pass. Mm-hmm. And now is it 55 percent for this bond? For yeah. this one? But I think if it passes with 55 percent, there's a limit on how much they can borrow. But if they got a two thirds, then they can borrow a ton more. Mm-hmm. So interesting. So let's let's, yeah. let's shift gears a little bit. Let's let's talk about um, uh, the, the city mayoral race. Mm. And I know that you're a big supporter of one of the candidates. You hosted a meet and greet at your home for Absolutely. one of the candidates. Walk me through that. What was it like to host an event for a candidate? Well, so Barbara Bree mm-hmm. is the candidate that I'm supporting for San Diego mayor. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a no brainer for me to host um, people coming to my home in Rancho Bernardo to get to meet Barbara. She she doesn't have as high name recognition as Todd Gloria does, Mm -hmm. Um, or, and I wouldn't say Scott Sherman specifically in terms of name recognition, but there are a lot of people that are just going to vote for the Republican. They don't care who it is. Um, And they don't care of criminal convictions, right? In in the case that we saw with Duncan Hunter, even the, (laughs) it's just like, I'm Republican (laughs) through and through. This is my tribe and cult. And I don't, you know, that's all I know. But Barbara Bree does not have the endorsement of the Democratic Party, which um, I've had a lot of issues with the Democratic Party current leadership and a lot mm-hmm. of this um, approach of it's time to start taking from the rich and a white woman from La Jolla, rich old lady, you know, doesn't know anything. <laughs> that really bothers me. It bothers me on the Trump Republican side when they mm-hmm. say things that are bigoted. And I find anybody saying a white man in a suit and a rich person in La Jolla are evil. Yeah, I, I have a big problem with it anywhere that I see that. Um, and I'm seeing some of that from the Democratic and mostly, I think, trying to rile up the young voters. Um, I've spoken up a few times about it of who, what exactly are you taking and what are you considering to be rich people? Um, and, you know, you try to get some clarification and it's just like this is not the message to push on to young people. Ultimately, you get them to go break windows somewhere and they're the ones that are going <laughs> to suffer the consequences. This is just irresponsible. Well, to- I, I get that a lot because people yeah. say, oh, you're a, a white male, gray hair. And, yeah. and they immediately like pigeonhole me as something. And I'm like, what are you doing? Right. You know, you're stereotyping me. We We're supposed to evolve beyond that. Right. That we're not stereotyped by race or age or gender. Mm-hmm. It's crazy. And Steve and I have a lot of con- I'm married to a white guy, right? Yeah. Um, we have a lot of conversations about that. I think there's something to be said of I cannot understand the lived experience of a black woman, let's say. I'm a Latina. That, that's or fair. A Mexican woman. And so you acknowledge those things. But anybody who says this person is bad because their skin is white, 
because they are devoutly Christian or Catholic or an, another religion or because they live in La Jolla. At one point in one of these back and forths with one of the Democratic leaders, it was, um, you know, how can somebody in Barrio Logan listen to her? And I said, well, first of all, I was a mentor through the Barrio Logan College Institute right. to uh, to one little girl, but then the mentor abandoned the sisters. And so I became the men mentor for all three of them. Um, you know, incredible challenges, but incredible young women. I would never tell them that you cannot pursue your dreams and become successful enough to go live in La Jolla. Right. If I could afford it, I would love to live near La Jolla Cove. Oh, you yeah. Know, or, yeah. <laughs> um, you don't begrudge somebody because they have been successful. And you certainly don't say this is not for anybody in Barrio Logan to aspire to or to right. connect with. So then they back up a little bit. Well, that's not what I'm saying. You know, so yeah. like, what are you saying? So what, what I find with Barbara Bree is she really is the outsider. Um, she's successful in her own right as a technology, not just as a tech investor, because she does a lot of tech investment with her husband, Neil. And that's how I got to know Barbara. Um, she was one of the uh, founders of Pro Flowers, helped to take really? that company public. Wow. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's a, I don't know what their value, you know, the $400 million value or um, it's a, certainly a, a very successful oh, um, good for her. You know, national, international yeah. company. Uh, before that, she sold her company to Microsoft. So she had a different company and she took that one to a successful exit. Wow. Um, she was one of the founders of The Voice of San Diego. Really? I think it's fascinating that she now won't give an interview to The Voice of San Diego because I think they've been a little bit biased or... Um, there's been a little bit of contention there. So I find that fascinating. They're celebrating their 15 year anniversary mm -hmm. and it's a big deal that yeah. your founding editor mm -hmm. is now running for mayor. Yeah. Um, however, they, that founding editor won't give you an interview and there's a story there that you, nobody wants to get too much into, but it is a successful, valuable local organization. Voice of San Diego, yeah, I think, is a model for journalism across the country. No doubt. They do great investigative work. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And she and, and they do a lot of, I think, public education where yes. they will get into the issues that other news outlets don't spend time on. Where does our water come from? Yeah. You know, how do things work? Yeah. Um, so I think that's valuable. She was involved in Connect, you know, uh, UCSD Connect. Really? Athena, which is an organization for the biotech industry that's very successful. She was one of the founding members of Run Women Run that worked this is like a renaissance woman. I know, that worked to elect wow. women, Republicans, independents, and, and Democrats. Um, so that's her background, is somebody who has been a, who's a proven leader. Wow. She attended Harvard when there weren't that many women. She was a single mother. Um, she's just an accomplished person. And I often say, this is, this is who I would obviously hire to run anything for me. You know, should you be fortunate enough to be able to attract somebody like Barbara to run any type of enterprise for you? Um, the mayor of the city is leading our, obviously, our budget, financial mm -hmm. uh, policy decisions. We have the real estate issue right now yeah. with the 101 Ash. What kind of a contract did we get ourselves into? And how do we have a building sitting vacant, burning half a million dollars a month, Yeah, $535,000 a month, while we have our city budget itself falling into structural deficits yes. for the first time yeah. under a Republican mayor because <laughs> the Republican Party is so fiscally conservative, yeah, right? right? Um, <laughs> so I think Barbara is absolutely the right person. She has rubbed people the wrong way. She put a stop to Soccer City. She has demanded transparency. She's endorsed by Donna Fry. Um, because, you know, transparency is not just an open government. It's not just when it's convenient or when you have something good to show. It's it's for the process of responsible governance. Agreed. Yes. And um, she has demanded that there be transparency when Republicans and Democrats have not wanted to necessarily speak to the decisions that they've made. Right. Um, so I think that she has a lot of um, people coming at her from uh, the Democratic Party as well as uh, the Republican side. And we'll see what happens. Yeah. So Gloria is a bit of a juggernaut, right? I mean, he's got like support from a lot of different people. Yeah, um, absolutely. he has every key endorsement. Which, um, which he is... has lined it all up and it's like, OK, how could you go wrong? I think he's a, you know, great to see him have the success that he's had at this assembly. And one day he wants to run for Congress. And is, mm -hmm. he's a, you know, success story of a minority candidate in San Diego. Um, but he's not the person that I would hand these billion dollar negotiations to uh, because I just don't think he has that experience. And there is something to be said about having some private sector experience and not just relying on your consultants or not just relying on the people that have funded your campaign to do the right thing for the San Diego taxpayer. Mm -hmm. That's just the that's the cold 
harsh reality, or at least as I see it. You know, what's um, interesting is when candidates, it, it's funny how when you try to evaluate a proposition or candidates, and sometimes you'll see endorsements from newspapers and other media companies, that tells you a little something, mm -hmm. but it's often the organizations that back the person um, will tell you a lot not only in terms of who supports them po as a positive trait, but who supports them that gives you a warning signal mm -hmm. that, that, oh, those guys are backing him. That's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's interesting. So in, the, in this mayoral race in March, they're taking the top two, right? Mm -hmm. We're deciding our mayor in March. Uh, it'll either be Gloria versus Sherman or Gloria versus Bree. Ah. So really the decision is being made in March. I think if it was uh, Gloria versus... Uh, versus Bree, Todd Gloria versus Barbara Bree, which for a while, that was the slate. Um, San Diego has become, I think, majority Democratic uh, registration. Right. There's no question in my mind that Bree would win because she would have the business sector, uh, Republican votes, independents, a little bit more conservative. Um, but she's a Democrat. She is a Democrat. Abs yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. When but you, she when can you speak to a broader coalition. Yes. And mm -hmm. and um, now with Sherman entering the race, and I think that had a lot to do with the Republican Party, the Republican consultants. It's, you know, they don't want to sit out this race. It's an opportunity to collect data. It's an opportunity to stick it to the person that stuck it to them, um, which is Barbara. Um, and so now you do have the people that are just going to vote Republican. Um, a lot of people are realizing that their vote for Sherman is really ultimately a vote for Gloria. And so we'll see what happens, I think, in terms of Republicans that actually do vote for Barbara Bree so that there is an experienced, proven business person right. um, that can ultimately lead our city. But it could also end up being Sherman versus Gloria. And I think that you will see a lot of the negative campaigning like you saw against Carl DeMaio. And I'm not a fan <laughs> of Carl DeMaio, but I will be the first person to say, like you did, mm -hmm. how repulsive it is to be running ads targeting somebody for being gay or for you know anything having yeah. to do other than their record of who yeah. they are versus yeah. what they're going to do. And so, you know, we'll see what happens, I think, in March. And we could potentially get into a uh, very sad and very dirty, you know, campaign. I guess it, ultimately, you know, you get close to the day of election and things just fall to the, um, you know, the dirty tricks and tactics. And that's <laughs> what people hate about politics. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I would hate to see that, but based on what we're already seeing from the Republican Party uh, in the East County race, it could be something that we also see, which would be terrible, um, you know, to do against our mayoral candidate. Well, I think Sherman got in late, right? Right. So that's it. He's that he puts agreed. Him he agreed to get pulled in. Like yeah. what a leader. So that's the, he's going to be at a disadvantage. He's got a slow start. But it's interesting because stereotypically, like, you know, I'm talking stereotypes with age, rage, and gender, but. It used to always be in California, you always thought Orange County was conservative. Mm -hmm. And then people would say, so is San Diego, but less than Orange County. Mm -hmm. And for a while, that was very true. Um, but the, the needle has moved a lot over the well, last- Orange County 20, is blue now. Blue. Yeah, yeah, they're blue now. But now it seems that the city of San Diego has a majority of Democratic voters. The county has a majority of Democratic mm -hmm. voters. It's amazing that Faulkner is the mayor of San Diego. Absolutely. You know, on that level. Um, so it's interesting. It would be interesting to see how Sherman does with the, um, you know, red no matter who, right? Mm -hmm. not, not and we have a lot of independents. So like you and I, a lot mm -hmm. of no party preference voters, I believe my district for Council District 5 um, is like one third, one third, one third. And so you have the Republicans. And I think at this point, people who are still in the Republican Party are pretty diehard. Yes. You had our Republican councilman, Mark Kersey, finally s step away from the Republican Party mm -hmm. and change his registration also to no party preference. And I give him huge credit. That's a very difficult thing to do yeah. when you're in that party machinery and these are the huge. people you know and, yeah. and you're making them very angry. Main Shine, of course, flipped over to Democrat and mm -hmm. Nathan Fletcher, the original, um, <laughs> you know, the wound to the <laughs> local Republican Party. Mm -hmm. They're still so, you know, hurt by that or upset oh, yeah. by that. Um, so you're seeing interesting shifts. And um, I think it's uh, it, it's interesting who the independents or no party preference voters are going to go for. Yeah, I think we're going to find out a lot. Yeah, because in a lot of ways, that is going to be the deciding. The Democrats, people registered Democrats are going to vote for their Democratic candidate. People registered Republicans are going to vote for the Republican candidate, mm -hmm. unless they're kind of looking down the road of what actually is going to happen. 
Um, but what will the independents do? And um, from people that I've talked to in political circles, they said they knew that there were a lot of people leaving the Republican Party and becoming independent, but they had no idea how many. Mm. Um, it's just the, you know, the numbers have just been absolutely stunning. Wow. Well, there's more independent or no party preference than there are Republicans or than there are Democrats. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. So, um, and it, what's interesting, this has always been one of my beefs is on the presidential debate stage, there's still only two lecterns. Right. You know, why isn't there someone representing all of us, no party preference? Bernie people? Sanders is an independent. They they say he's not even a Democrat. Yeah, that's true. And I say, well, you know what? <laughs> that's not a bad thing in my eyes, but we do have the two party system. And that's a whole other thing that, you well, know. Our time's running l l low here, but I want to just touch on at least one more thing. And it's the... San Diego County Supervisor Race, District 2. Yes. The one that's involving P Poway Mayor Steve Voss. Um, interested in your take on that race and the County Board of Supervisors. Ooh, that's a tough one. Let me first say that I also hosted a uh, coffee chat uh, for Marnie Von Wilpert. I have to get that name out there for Council District 5. Oh, yeah. Who yeah, would be right. taking over for Mark Kersey. I think she's phenomenal, and I hope people um, vote so for her. You, and have had two her. meet and greets at your home. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and I'll probably have another one. I mean, it's, you know. Good for you. You said a little bit about what is it like. You go buy some cookies and donuts and coffee. Um, the one I had for Barbara was just after New Year's Eve, so we still had a bottle of champagne, and so we did mimosas. The neighbors all came down nice. from the cul-de-sac. We had our Republican neighbors were there, and they really liked Barbara. Um, we had you know people who aren't involved in politics at all. I'm like, wait, we're voting in March? It's just so important <laughs> to you know bring the community together. So it's not anything that's really all that difficult, but some people don't want to put up a sign even, right? We have our Barbara B sign, and I think it's nice for people to get involved, but it can be... Um, you know, it can be a little intimidating to people. It shouldn't be. Yeah. So anyway, Marnie Von Wilpert, I think she would be a great councilwoman and hopefully Barbara Bree will be our next mayor. Supervisor. Um, I'm a huge fan of Diane Jacob. I think mm -hmm. she is one of, again, proven, effective. Uh, she's often been called the most powerful politician. Now people are saying Lorena Gonzalez is the most powerful politician in, in San Diego County. So mm -hmm. I'm happy to see that women are, you know, mm -hmm. plowing ahead and, and bringing um, positive change um, to our region. Um, Diane Jacob, I trust her judgment. And I think that she has done um, great work for her district. And mm -hmm. I know that she is supportive of Steve Voss right. over, um, oh gosh. Joel Anderson. Joel Anderson. Yeah. Um, so in that sense, I tend to trust her judgment. Um, there is a third party candidate um, that I think has less experience in that race. There, right? There is an independent candidate who also wears a cowboy hat. Oh, you're kidding. Then yeah. that's not who I'm thinking of. <laughs> and then there's a, a, a fourth person who I think she's a Democrat. Oh, then it must be the Democrat. And she's like a, a works for the county, like in some kind of therapist work. Right. I think so. So less experience. Yes. Um, you know, I have a lot of problems with Steve Voss and mm -hmm. he knows this. I've just spoken to him directly. A anybody who knows me knows that I will happily openly say to somebody any criticism that I have, mm -hmm. and it comes from a good place. It's never, you know, the person um, specifically who they are. Um, there's just, you know, the whole praising Alex Jones being on that podcast, yeah. um, not being strong enough, uh, condemning things that I think a leader should say. We simply don't put up with this. Um, so I've had a lot of problems with that in the past. And then there's a lot of things, I think, in Poway where, you know, you're making appointments, um, are you representing all parts of the city equally? I don't live in Poway, so I try not to say, you know, too much. They have incredible staff there. Um, they, you know, it's uh, it's always been held up as a well-run city. Mm -hmm. Again, my boys went to school at Valley. Right. And so the, the library, the community center, um, the, the city council before this current council did do a lot of partnerships with Valley Elementary, mm -hmm. funding technology and helping us with the 5K run that we would do around Lake Poway. Just a lot of really great work. Um, you know, you don't agree with everybody. And so I don't agree with everything that Steve Voss mm -hmm. has, um, has said in the past, certainly. I mean, I really, really had problems with his appearance on Alex Jones. Yeah. This is a person who says that Sandy Hook didn't happen. Right. And who's, you know, People's murdered children were props. Right. I just can't imagine anything more irresponsible and insulting and hurtful. Mm -hmm. um, and and that was a point for me in politics where I was like, where are we? Like, what are we even doing? Mm -hmm. How is this even happening? I don't understand what's happening. Um, and so that for me is um, is a problem. 
I think he's backed away from that, you know? Yeah, he has. Okay, yeah. good. I don't know if he's apologized or said this is not a person who's good for well, I don't know our if he said civic that. discourse or just I regret I was I was there laughing at these. Mm. Right? That's the difficult yeah. thing. Yeah. I, again, I take that back. I don't know <laughs> I if don't he's know disavowed either. him or not. I hope he does. Yeah. Because everyone tells me he's a really good person. Yeah. Um, and, you know, he's trying to do the right thing. And he at the synagogue, um, you know, initially it was this is not Poway. And... It is Poway. It yeah. happened in Poway. Yeah. So let's not, I don't know what it helps to say this isn't happening. I mean, yeah. you're not in Alex Jones territory of saying <laughs> this didn't happen. Yeah. <laughs> but, it, yeah. you know, th- yeah. It's, this, ha- this is happening. Yes, My boys have swastikas spray painted yeah. at their schools. Yes. My friend's nephew, every time he opens his book, somebody writes a swastika in it. And this, this there are the little things like that that are so hurtful and scary. And like, who's doing this and why? How are they bringing these values from their homes? And then you see it spray painted with threats of Parkland was nothing. We're going to shoot up the school. That's what we're dealing with as parents. Yeah, and yeah. then you have the actual helicopter. I mean, the the synagogue is less than a mile from my house. Yeah. Um, and so this is happening. Um, I, you know, I hope that he can take the lead from a responsible person like Diane Jacob, who is very conservative um, but ultimately took the stance um, with the rest of the county supervisors. And that's really where I think we're seeing the greatest change in San Diego County is in the supervisors. It's always been a very well-run um, local government under mm-hmm. Walt Eckhart. And we yeah. have incredible county administrators. Um, she uh, took the stand to sue the Trump administration over some of the tactics where ICE is just releasing people onto our streets. Right. You know, people with babies. Like, there you go. You're dumped on the sidewalk and... Uh, you know, good luck. We, we refuse to make a phone call yeah. to a relative that you might have in Escondido or in Los Angeles who could at least come and pick up this totally disoriented yeah. um, political asylee mm-hmm. that we have approved. Again, these are people who have gone through the process and we just don't give them the courtesy of have somebody to pick you up. We just throw them on our streets. And so what does that do? Now we have more homeless people and now we're going to have a baby who's going to come down with pneumonia because they're forced to sleep on a sidewalk at night. It's, it's, um, it's a very, um, you know, sad situation. And she, I think was on the right side of that. And I hope Steve Voss continues to take steps to be on the right side of, um, you know, difficult decisions. I think ultimately he'll advance um, after the March 3rd primary. That's mm-hmm. my guess. It'll be him and probably Joel Anderson. Mm-hmm. We'll move to the finals in March. And and like like you said, you know, with, um, you know, talking about getting endorsements from, Voss has gotten a lot of endorsements, but not mm-hmm. from the Republican Party. Oh, I know. That's interesting. Yeah, it is. So um, I'm fascinated by the race. Obviously, it has a local implication in Poway. Mm-hmm. You know, it'll imagine if he wins and then we have to have an appointment for a new mayor. And how that, how's that oh, going to work? I don't, yeah. See, again, yeah. I don't track Poway yeah. Council as closely. Um, and I didn't know that he didn't have the Republican endorsement. To me, that's a good thing. Yeah. I'm not a fan of Tony Kavarik and the Republican Party. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that they um, that's just not responsible leadership. I don't understand how anybody can say that 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 has been successful right even by their own standards um and and then you just get into the the, just the basic ethics Mm -hmm. i had an instance with tony where we had that data breach at poway unified where this is all of our information yeah our kids medical information you know the nickname of your child and who their caregiver is who is allowed to come and pick them up what their phone number is, just, you know, again, we get into Power Unified being run <laughs> where you're doing things yeah. responsibly. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, we were at one of the board meetings and he said something like, why is it always you? Why does your name keep coming up? And I said, well, I don't know what you're talking about, but these these are our kids and it's all of our kids. So this is something that I would hope you would also not want to see happening. And, you know, he so it was kind of like a, we're parents. Let's talk to each other as human beings and as parents. Right. And instead it was just, uh, you know, I, you're staging these things somehow. And it what? just was, again, you get into Jeez. like kind of crazy town and yeah. it, very disappointing because I always give people the benefit of the doubt. Yeah, Our kids do. are not Republicans or Democrats. You right. know, the roads are not the taxpayer dollars yeah. are not. Yeah. You know, don't have values other than the financial value. Like, let's just all make good decisions. Ultimately, we all want our kids to be successful. We want them to have a great city to grow up in. Mm -hmm. Um, And we should be able to work together. I have one final question before we wrap this up. This is probably the most important question. 
I need your take on the Super Bowl halftime oh. show. Because <laughs> I was a big, I know you had some, may shared some things on, on, on uh, Twitter, I think it was. Oh, yeah. Uh, but Man, that, that was that controversial. Was, yeah, it was amazing. It became a controversial thing. Yeah, and it was funny because um, we watched the Super Bowl with my parents. Yeah. And so my mom is very conservative, you mm-hmm. know, Catholic, Trump, yeah. um, proper uh, you know, women should be in the home taking care of their kids, mm-hmm. which is kind of a very funny contrast, you mm-hmm. know, to me. She's like, what are you, an activist? And I said, I hope I'm an activist. Yes, I'm teaching my kids you are an the right things. So, you know, but she's just like, oh, my God, what's going on? My daughter should, you know, why aren't you just shopping and getting your nails done? I'm like, because I don't want to <laughs> do that stuff. I want to go to the council meeting. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, I initially saw the show yeah. and thought the last thing that I as a Latina need is the sexy Latina shaking. You know, that's already what the perception is in mm-hmm. many. And again, I work all over the country. And so you go to certain parts of the country and they've never met a Mexican. I mean, they they believe a Mexican person is a, a field worker. Right. Um, and that's mm-hmm. all that they have experienced. And my sister's husband is from Kentucky. And so she experiences a little bit of that when they go back to Kentucky. Why would you teach your kids to speak Spanish? You know, what what the maid has to learn how to speak English. Why do we have to speak her language? Right. And it's very blatant and it's hurtful and it's not you know, it's not true right. that the language is only used for one purpose. So I initially saw it as like, oh, no, here's like another representation of a Latina um, as a strip dancer. Right. And I didn't know a lot about Shakira. And I was thinking back, like my cousins and my family's like, she's wild and barefoot all the time. <laughs> um, and, and that actually is one of her signature and her foundation is yeah. called Pies Descalzos. Um, You know, and I don't know what that really has to do with Colombia, because what people don't realize is Latin American culture, Hispanic culture is so diverse. And so Shakira represents Latin American, a little bit of Caribbean. I worked for the governor of Puerto Rico for a while in uh, Washington, D.C., and that's a whole different culture. And then you have Puerto Ricans in the Bronx. Oh, yeah. And New York. Yeah. And that's a very different culture. Yes. People from San Salvador, people from Guatemala. Yeah. When I lived in D.C., there were not a lot of Mexicans there. So burritos. No, you were eating other food. <laughs> yeah. Right. And when I lived in Spain, that's a whole other Hispanic right. experience. Sure. Like they didn't know what a tortilla. Well, they do know a tortilla for them is an egg omelet, which is not. Really? Oh, yeah. Yeah. The tortilla española. And so I'm used to California, mariachi, Mexican culture. Right. Um, And Steve always says, so you don't like the whole Miami thing? I'm like, I don't really know the whole. It's not my experience with Spanish and my culture. But, man, they started getting with the instruments. And um, I, you know, I my initial reaction was, oh, this is not good for women, (laughs) for Latina women. And then I was watching it more and thinking, this is an amazing show from the choreography standpoint. Oh, it's awesome. And this to me does not seem sexualized strip club. I'm like, this is like Cirque du Soleil. This is what the whole, you know, the way that it's choreographed and her moment on the pole was more of like holding her body up. And Steve is like, she's 50. I'm thinking, what? You know, I'm 46. And so, wow, uh, what a different experience. And looking back, and then, of course, they had her daughter singing with her. Yeah, that was something. And they had the kids in the cages, Mm -hmm. and um, she had her born in the USA. You know, we love Bruce Springsteen. Steve loves Bruce Springsteen, being from, you know, New Jersey, Freehold, and Mm -hmm. the Stone Pony. And so that was awesome. (laughs) Um, And holding up the Puerto Rican flag. A lot of people, I think, thought it was the Texas flag, and they were so happy. And then they're like, oh, no, it's the Puerto Rican flag. We hate that flag. It was two-sided, if I recall. Right. So it was the American flag on one side. Right. And then she opened it up and it was the Puerto Rican flag while they sang, I was born in the USA. Um, And that's the USA. Of course. These people, I mean, Puerto (laughs) Ricans fight in our military. They can be drafted. Yeah. I don't think they can vote for president, though. And they don't have a congressional representative. So that's at the time I was working for the governor. Um, They were having the plebiscite or they were having the vote on whether or not Puerto Rico would become the 51st state. And interestingly enough, the Puerto Rican people did not want to be the 51st state. And we were making the case of you would get as much funding as a state for health care, for infrastructure, for education. How can you say no to this? And they said, because we want our own soccer team in the World Cup and we need to have our own Miss Miss Universe. And we are Puerto Rico. And so, you know, that's a little bit of the history behind it. But when I looked at the totality of the of the show, 
I was totally turned into this a fan. Mm -hmm. um, and I learned a little bit more about Shakira and some of the interviews. She has a really good interview with Katie Couric. Mm -hmm. It was from a while ago where Katie Couric says, you're such a thoughtful, intelligent person um, and you're self-made and you write all your music, mm -hmm. you choreograph everything, you play the instruments, you write the lyrics and you are a global, you've built an empire. But why do you have to shake and, you know, her father's Lebanese. And she said, because I love to dance that way and because I want to move that way and because life is short and you should do what you want if it isn't hurting anybody else and it's right. bringing you joy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was just such an interesting, you know, description of this is now she's a mother. Um, so this is somebody who is dancing and doing it the way that she wants. And that's actually a very empowering thing. And she explained to Katie Couric, you know, the video is the very last thing. I've already mm -hmm. written the song, gotten um, all of the musicians together and we've choreographed it. And now it's celebration, like let's dance and yeah. like really show this to the world. And so who's telling me that I can't belly dance when it comes from my Lebanese roots? And who's telling me that I can't be barefoot when in Colombia and on the beaches, we dance barefoot and we shake like this. And if the world has a problem with it, then it's too bad for them that they're not able to celebrate. Mm -hmm. And that's OK, actually. Right. They can celebrate in their ways. So that's just the, you know, the Shakira take. And I think J-Lo is a whole, um, you know, different approach. Um, but I, I actually... I find it very hypocritical that people who are okay with some of, you know, some of the history from our current first lady where it was yeah. certain modeling, yeah. you know, again, at least in this case, um, they are the producers and nobody's forcing them and they are the business owners, really. And they're choreographing and this is what they want to show versus, you know, young, potentially exploited uh, mm -hmm. Trump model. Mm -hmm. Very different circumstance. Um, so it's complicated, but everybody has an opinion. It is. It was complicated, and it was it, everyone. It was it was a hot thing, you know, for the couple of days after the Super Bowl. Oh yeah. How it became this political thing, you know. My take was is that I'm watching. Okay, I, I know it's J Lo and Shakira. So I expect it's going to be Latina, mm -hmm. lots of dancing, uh, very you know multicultural. So I'm mm -hmm. I'm up for that. Of course, the choreography was amazing. I mean, mm -hmm. the way that they're so synchronized is unbelievable. Right. I the guy dancers. Oh, all of them. <laughs> I, was, I mean, it's just unbelievable. Yeah. So the, the, the rehearsal for that has mm -hmm. got to be just tremendous. And the way they get the stage up so quick right. and do it, it's amazing. I love that Shakira played guitar. Led Zeppelin. Yeah, that was so yeah, awesome. Yeah. So you know, usually the you think of, you know, some of these entertainers as maybe – you know, other people are writing the music. Right. Well, Shakira's legit. You know, right. she's doing her right. own stuff. She's a legitimate musician. I, I, I did think, you know, I, I expected because, you know, Latina is, you know, the Latin culture is a lot more sexualized than right. American. Spicy, culture. everybody says. Spicy. That's a good and way I'm to like, say oh, it. Oh, gosh, don't say that in a business meeting, though. You're going to get yourself in yeah. trouble. <laughs> but there I thought there were a few like moments mm -hmm. that it was a they were pushing the envelope mm -hmm. right you know like uh cameras like uh, angles mm -hmm. that you know i'm trying to keep my language correct here but but i thought that they were pushing it sure okay and i think you could say the poll might be one example of pushing it and so then i was like hmm and, and, and but then overall i was like oh, this is good you know mm -hmm. it's just to me it was like another halftime show that's usually pretty good but then afterwards, and I saw how it became where people were offended, and I thought, oh, you're get, you're going too far with the offensive. Mm -hmm. And then the other people reacting, saying, this is great, and this is why it's great. And I and then I evolved a little further, and then I came to the point is like, yeah, it's fine, you know, it's all yeah. good. I still don't like polls. <laughs> yeah, you know, the I don't. To me, but, it was like, why? But if I look at it as a Cirque du Soleil, and it's like a athleticism. You know, it's a little different. You go to, they have, what do they have those, like the scarves and yeah, they, yeah, yeah. you know, they do, it is Cirque du Soleil. Yeah. And I'm not a huge fan. We've seen that in Vegas. And Steve and I are like, what did we see? Uh, Viva La Rev or something. And uh -huh. he's like, Viva La, no. <laughs> yeah. so it's funny though, but there is a hypocrisy because you'll see, you know, you know, a, a Caucasian singer, dancer wearing very oh, little. Sure. And the cheerleaders. And the cheerleaders are, you know, and, and the whole thing. So. You, if you're if you really look at it with an open mind, you can see the hypocrisy that mm -hmm. exists. Um, but it's it was just fascinating to see the conversation on social media from this. Mm -hmm. uh, well, because I think it was brought into the NFL. And whose game is this? Yeah. And whose moment, whose stage is it? Yeah. And that I think people had a big problem. Of, well, the cheerleaders are one thing. There are cheerleaders mm -hmm. and 
we don't care if they do the splits and the whatever and if they are former strippers or mm-hmm. you know like that's and that's maybe not the politically correct term but that's the term that people use um and so it was yeah it was a it was fascinating how explosive yeah and how invested yeah, yeah. people were meanwhile yeah. i'm like playing shakira in my car every day now <laughs> driving around in the tesla well, so you said you were driving when on you the came way up here, here. Yeah. yeah and i was like oh my gosh the halftime show has like over a hundred million views more than the highlights from the game it, you know you see the the segment mm-hmm. um and it was incredibly produced i think it was jay-z that um, that produced it for really? the NFL. I mean, wow. it, it, just in terms of every moment and so fast um, and the back, the male backup dancers were amazing. I thought that was incredible. But then I look at one of Shakira's video for Chantaje and it has like 2.4 billion views. Yeah. I'm like, oh, never mind. Well, because of her dancing, it's, it gets and, a lot well, of attention. And she's a she's an international star. No, no doubt about and it. And the Waka Waka with the World Cup. So we, we're reminded <laughs> There's another world. And if you're on the yeah. beach in the Caribbean, you're going to see people dancing this way. I mean, you go to Hawaii and the, it, oh, yeah. what are the, hula, the hula dancers. Yeah. It's OK as long as it's framed in the way that certain people agree with. Yes. And that's the problem. Yes, I like yes, that this yes. broke out of like, this is how we're going to dance. A lot of it was they have to get the younger culture. And that's maybe I don't know who the two rappers were. And I was like, what is that? But they also do have to capture, you know, the teens and it has to be um, interesting to them. So I think I think they did okay. Do you know the NFL doesn't pay them? No. Well, what is it? Exposure? That's kind of the deal. So they they say that they'll pay for the whole production and all the people Mm -hmm. coming out. But but Shakira and J-Lo themselves individually made zero. Mm -hmm. And you're thinking. Uh, of course, they're getting huge benefit out right. of it. Right. And they don't need that particular gig, if you will, they don't, for, for the monetary. Yeah. But um, still, the NFL is loaded. This is the Super Bowl. Are they? they? Why are they not being compensated? You know? <laughs> are you sure the NFL is? I mean, look at the NRA has disintegrated and a lot of institutions that we believe and have seen to be so strong are maybe not what we thought. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, no, football is an interesting one. Well, that'll be another show. Um, but <laughs> There's a lot of political and cultural things that goes on with the NFL. so much, so yeah, much. Propaganda. Yeah. I mean, we the can go for it. sport itself. Yeah, exactly. You know? I think it's good that in society we're seeing more of it, more of everything, right? We're just exploring different angles. Heroes are no longer heroes. What's right, what's wrong, what's offensive. Mm-hmm. Um, I was talking to somebody because they were saying, um, you know, it's either right or wrong. And I said, you know, it used to be black or white yeah. or this is red, this is blue. But now there's so much information and you can have 5,000 variations of yes. the color blue and yes. of the color red. Yeah. And now you're talking about this shade versus that shade. And the, you know, it's a little bit scary. I think people don't know what they think anymore. Right. Um, I had a neighbor who's like retired FBI. And I remember when I think the Pope came out and said that gay marriage was okay. You know, and he's just like, so gays are going to be getting married. I said, yeah, (laughs) it's okay. Yeah. He's like, you're okay with this? I said, yes, my nephew's gay. And I can't wait to see who he chooses to marry. Maybe you'll meet him. He'll come and he'll probably have Mm -hmm. his boyfriend with him. He's like, and that's okay. This was a few years ago. And I said, yes, it's okay. You know, it's, I think we have to have an understanding that all of this change is difficult for people. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's, you know, it's humanity and, um, it's messy, but that's, you know, people, people are complicated. Mm -hmm. Um, but ultimately I loved what you said in one of your prior podcasts was, was there's a lot of BS and bigotry going around and politicians for their reasons will blatantly lie or will do something that is blatantly hypocritical. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, you, you're living your life and you have the people around you and you just have to make the right choices. And everything I do, I try to do as an example for my kids. That's the audience mm-hmm. I care about. I don't yeah, care yeah. about attacks on social mm-hmm. media or somebody, mm-hmm. oh, so-and-so doesn't like you. Great. <laughs> you know, no problem. Well, you're not going to be invited to this. Great. Let more time for me to focus on my kids and not, you know, be at an event or whatever it might be. Um, so, yeah, I really, really loved how you explained that, where ultimately it's your your neighbors and your community and um, just the way that you're building your own ethical, um, you know, boundaries. And um, I guess at the end of the day, it's your legacy. Right. You got to live your life according to your own values. Right. You know, and you can only affect what's within your realm and Mm -hmm. um, and be a good example for your children. And it's important to speak out. I think it's so important. A lot of people say, I can't affect anything in Washington. 
Um, it means a lot. I remember hearing, um, it was Mark Cafferty actually from the uh, EDC, from San Diego EDC, mm -hmm. and he was on a show talking about the value that Tijuana and the Mexican border and the contributions to the economy and how there's talented people. And I didn't expect it to really hit me emotionally. Like, oh, here's a local economic leader saying, hey, guys, no, actually, Mexicans are good. And Tijuana <laughs> is wonderful. Yes, yes. And they actually bring a lot of economic yeah, value. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I know that because I go to Tijuana and, yeah. and um, you know, and we see the impact that the Latino um demographics do have mm -hmm. but it was like wow thanks for you know i guess not thanks for saying that he was being interviewed and he was answering the question but it's nice to know that there are people who um you know will speak up it takes a lot sometimes if you're in the republican party or if you're in certain echelons and for that i will give uh kevin falconer credit he did not go full trump yeah right <laughs> um and so i think that's been a very good thing for mm -hmm. california and i don't know everything that they're balancing necessarily um, but, it, you know, everyone's trying to do their best. I do believe that. Gabby, we can go forever. <laughs> I know. I, this is awesome. I love my conversations. We cover a lot of ground. Yeah. And um, I enjoy having you as a guest. And I hope you'll come back again and we can cover other issues. But I think our audience gets a lot of value from our conversation mm -hmm. because we did touch on so many things, politics, culture, local, national um, international, international, yeah. pardon me. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you. This is such an incredible platform. And I think you don't realize how many people are listening in so many different places. Um, but yeah, I see it shared and people reference it in the community. Did you hear so-and-so? You got to go listen to the podcast uh, and listen to this person. And, and especially when you're talking about, um, you know, how you form your own opinions and statements that I think are important for the community to hear. I'm very appreciative when you do that. Right on. Okay. We'll be back. Thanks, Gabby. <laughs> Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you so much.